Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Integrated DNA Technologies webinar on the Alter CRISPR Cas9 system, ribonucleoprotein delivery and optimization. My name is Dr. Hans Packer, and I will be serving as the moderator for today's presentation. That presentation today will be given by Dr. Rolf Turk. Rolf is a staff scientist here in the Molecular and Genetics Applied Research Group at IDT, where he's been working on a variety of projects, including the optimization of delivery protocols for oligonucleotides, protein, and the CRISPR-Cas9 system components. Dr. Turk received his PhD in molecular genetics from the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, where he studied disease mechanisms underlying muscular dystrophy using high-throughput methodologies. Ralph's presentation today should last about 45 minutes, and following the presentation, Ralph will answer your questions. As attendees, you have been muted, but we encourage you to ask questions or make comments at any time during or after the presentation by typing them into the questions box, and you'll find that located at the right-hand side of your screen in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, if you just see the questions saying there's a little plus sign or an up arrow, depending on whether you're on a Mac or a PC, and if you just click on that, it'll make the window larger, and you can type your question and send those to me. Um, following the presentation, I will forward as many of those questions on to Ralph to answer as, as we can in the allotted time. Um, and if we don't get to your question, we will follow up with you by email later on. So you will get an answer to your question if you have something that you would like to know. Um, in case you want to revisit the webinar or you have to leave early for some reason, we're also recording this presentation and we'll make that available to you through our website, www.idtdna.com. We have a video library that will contain this webinar once we get it posted, as well as past webinars, and that's under our Support and Education tab. And then we also have a YouTube channel where this and other videos will be posted, which is www.youtube.com forward slash idtdnabio. And people often ask us for the slides, and we already have the slides posted at www.slideshare.net forward slash IDT DNA. Don't go look at them right now. I get distracted. <laughs> um, so with all of that housekeeping stuff out of the way, I'm just going to let Ralph begin his talk. Ralph? Thank you so much, Hans, uh, for your introduction. So like Hans said, I'm going to talk about uh, the use of RNPs or ribonucleoprotein complexes uh, and talk about the delivery and optimization strategies that we have come up with and would like to suggest to you. So first of all, an outline of our, uh, of our presentation. Uh, the first half of the presentation, I will talk about the formation, stability, and activity of the ribonucleoprotein complex. And then in the second half, I will go more into detail about how to deliver the RMP complex using liposuction or electroporation. And we'll uh, hand out some pointers to you how to optimize that if necessary. So first of all, I want to kind of start off with a uh, overview of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So this uh, uh, methodology is, uh, has been a, quite a major biotechnological breakthrough in that it allows for more efficient and more robust and faster genome editing uh, than conventional methods. So the, the CRISPR-Cas9 system contains a of two parts. The first part is the Cas9 protein, which is a nuclease. The second part is the guide RNA complex. The guide RNA complex consists of two parts itself. The first part is the CRISPR RNA, and the second part is the tracer RNA. The tracer RNA is necessary to bind to the Cas9 protein. And what is special about this guide RNA complex is the protospacer, as it is called, sequence on the CRISPR RNA. And this sequence can uh, guide the, nuclei, the nuclease to specific genomic locations based on complementary uh, uh, sequence. So once the two-part, or this is what we refer to, the two-part guide RNA complex binds to uh, Cas9, it forms the RMP complex. Again, it can be uh, uh, guided to specific locations within the genome, and it uh, is driven by sequence homology based on the CRISPR RNA and the presence of so-called PAM sites, which uh, differ for different types of uh, Cas9-like nucleases, but in the ca case of Cas9, it's NGG. Now, once the uh, ribonucleoprotein complex 
is binding to its specific genomic DNA location, uh, the Cas9 protein will create a double-stranded break, as can be seen over here. The cell can deal with this double-stranded break in, in two ways. First of all, it can uh, activate a pathway called non-homologous end joining, where the two ends of the double-stranded break are uh, ligated back together. However, um, during this process, uh, there can be insertion or deletion of uh, nucleotides, and this will in case you are targeting a coding region, can lead to uh, uh, frame shifts that can uh, uh, create a gene knockout, for instance. The other uh, possibility that can happen is that a different pathway is activated, and this is called homology-directed repair. And one thing you need for that, after the double strand break, is the presence of a DNA template that has homologous overlaps with the two uh, arms that are uh, on, on, on either side of the cut. And you can use this methodology to actually insert or repair your uh, uh, targeted sequence. So I want to point out quickly that on the IDT website, there are a number of uh, presentations uh, available to you where we go into more detail about the background of the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system. Uh, Unfortunately, due to time, uh, I will focus mainly on the RMP uh, delivery and optimization, but please uh, have a look at the website at the other webinars. So um, there are two ways to, uh, or sorry, there are many ways to introduce the two components of the CRISPR-Cas9 system into your cell, and I will discuss them uh, separately. On the left side, you can see the Cas9 protein, and Cas9 can be expressed in your cell by uh, transfection of a uh, Cas9 expression plasmid that uh, codes for Cas9 protein. You can also introduce Cas9 mRNA that codes for Cas9, or you can use a, a Cas9 stable cell line. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, the most efficient way is to uh, deliver Cas9 protein itself into the cell, and I'll go into detail why uh, these, uh, or, or how this works, and what benefits they are, or give. Now, on the left part, you can see the other part necessary to perform CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, and that's uh, trying to, or, or having a guide RNA expressed into your cell. So, um, you can get expression of a uh, guide RNA in a form of what is referred to as a single guide RNA, where the two parts, that is the CRISPR and the tracer, are linked together and form uh, a single transcript. Um, and you can introduce that uh, via plasmids. You can also use synthetic uh, double-stranded uh, uh, DNA uh, fragments, uh, which are called G-blocks, G that uh, drive the expression of the single guide RNA. Or you can introduce your single guide RNA by in vitro transcribed uh, single guide uh, RNA. Now, the system that uh, that we have is called the two-part system, where we have the CRISPR RNA and the tracer RNA uh, manufactured uh, separately, and uh, these two uh, parts come as uh, RNA oligos to you, where you can put them together and form the guide RNA complex. And that's another route of putting it into your cell. Now, we recommend the use of the ribonucleoprotein complexes uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, what is beneficial about introduction of Cas9 protein complex together with your CRISPR or tracer RNA complex or your guide RNA complex is that it has immediate activity in your cell, so it can do its job right away. Um, it also reduces off-target effects. So overall, the Cas9 protein and its uh, guide RNA complex are, are turned over, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, are, are turned over, and that kicks in after about 48 hours. But especially that first window of 48 hours gives enough time for the uh, RMP complex to do its job. Uh, the third point is uh, 
using RMPs uh, gives a very easy workflow, and I will go into that in the in the uh, next slides. It provides also high reproducibility, and there's no toxicity observed in using this uh, system. So here's a schematic of the workflow for using the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 RMP system. Uh, as I mentioned before, the first step is the guide RNA complex formation. And this is achieved by combining the CRISPR RNA together with the tracer RNA and do a, a heat cool cycle in a PCR tube, for instance, or in an Epdorf tube. And this allows for the hybridization of the two components together to form the guide RNA complex. Once the uh, uh, guide RNA complex is formed, uh, Cas9 can be added, and this will lead to a functional ribonucleic protein complex. Now, this step, or these two steps, take, take about half an hour. Uh, and you can do it again in an Eppendorf tube or PCR tube, and it's uh, easy to use. Now, the last step is then, of course, the delivery of your RMP into the cell. Uh, this will take somewhat longer dependent on the protocol that you have, and we'll go over that part in the second half of the talk. The way that we detect genome editing events in our cells is by use of the T7 and the nucleus 1 system. And what we do is we, first of all, amplify our targeted locus. And what you can expect is that certain alleles will not be edited depending on the efficiency of your editing system. In other alleles, you can have an insertion of DNA or a deletion of, of DNA. And uh, heterogeneity is something that we use uh, as follows. So after our initial PCR, we do a heat cool cycle again. And a couple of things can happen. Uh, you can have homoduplexes formed where the both strands are fully complementary. Uh, but the other thing that can happen is you can have heteroduplexes formed where, for instance, a wild-type strand uh, matches together with a strand with an insertion or a deletion or vice versa. And it's these combinations, the heteroduplexes, that are recognized by the T7 uh, endonuclease 1. It cuts the uh, uh, mismatch uh, mismatches that occur right at the five prime, five prime end of the top strand. And this, uh, and these digested fragments is something that we can then detect on, say, an agro shell or a fragment analyzer. Um, by calculating the ratio of your cut fragments to your full length fragments, that is how we determine the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, cleavage efficiency. Now, one thing that the T7 and the nucleus 1 is not great at is the detection of single nucleotide deletions and insertions. Uh, so the drawback of this me methodology is that you will not get the full uh, idea of, of what your uh, editing efficiency is. However, it's an underestimation. If you want to have a good idea of what's precisely going on, we would recommend to sequence your uh, uh, amplified products. But this is a much faster and uh, easier way to do it. <clears throat> now over here in this graph, we compared uh, the efficiency of different guide RNA complexes. Uh, we designed guide RNA complexes that target four different sites on the HBRT gene. And then we compared different types of guide RNA complexes. So in green, we have our, our uh, two-part system that comprises of a shortened uh, CRISPR RNA and a shortened tracer RNA. And we compare that to the editing efficiency that you can obtain with native uh, two-part system. And that's the naturally occurring uh, uh, guide RNA that you can find in uh, bacteria. We also compared it to single guide RNAs obtained by IVT or through uh, the expression, uh, or through plasmid ex expression and through um, expression by uh, G blocks. So as you can see over here, 
the overall maximal editing efficiency we observed was using our, our CRISPR RNA system, uh, indicating that this uh, is preferable compared to the other methodologies. Now, if you want to target a certain gene, uh, you can have a look at your, uh, for instance, your axon that you want to target. And one thing, as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, is what uh, Cas9 protein requires is a so-called PAM site or a protospacer adjacent motif. So this is based on an NGG sequence, and uh, a lot of the sequences within an axon will, will contain those GG pairs, and the N, of course, is something you can fill in yourself. Um, but then the question arises, okay, which, which of the PAM sites or which of the CRISPR RNAs should I use? So uh, in order to answer that question, we uh, designed CRISPR RNAs against every PAM site on different axons of a number of uh, genes. And as an example, I, I, I show you three axon pairs uh, here on, on, on this slide. And for every CRISPR RNA target site, we determined the editing efficiency. And then what we did, we ranked the editing efficiency, uh, as you can see here, from light, from uh, sorry, low to high. And um, one thing that pointed out was that the majority of target sites are actually giving very good editing uh, efficiencies. So nonetheless, we do recommend testing uh, three uh, CRISPR RNA sites per target for uh, getting a high probability for your successful on-targeting editing. When it comes to designing your CRISPR RNA, uh, I'd like to show you this slide because online uh, we have a tutorial available how to, uh, or just to show which sequence you have to put in into our, into our ordering uh, tool. Uh, there's a couple of common errors that you can make, but if you take a look at the slide, uh, it, it, it should be pretty straight, straightforward to uh, uh, design your own CRISPR RNAs. And of course, the tracer RNA is a standard uh, product because the specificity for your target is only defined by the protospacer, which is only present on your CRISPR RNA. So when it comes to gene editing, one thing that you need to know is are a couple of things about your target. So <clears throat> one thing that I would uh, recommend looking into is once you made a choice, which, which for instance, exon you want to target, is to uh, have a close look whether multiple transcript isoforms are present and if, and if uh, these uh, splice variants could actually uh, have a result or an effect on your result. Furthermore, uh, I would suggest taking a close look whether SNPs are present in your protos protospacer sequence. Also for the outcome, it's uh, good to know what the ploidy of your, of your cells is and to get an idea of what the editing efficiency is. But also it's good to know if there's a known phenotype for the gene that you're targeting. Uh, for instance, if you knock out a gene and, and it becomes lethal, you, and if you don't know that, you might think that there are some problems going on with your uh, methodology, but it's actually the downstream event that is causing your uh, problem. Uh, the last point that I point out here is if you want to select for monoclonal populations, uh, first of all, I would recommend doing a, uh, checking the editing efficiency on the entire batch to see uh, what the chances are of picking uh, individual clones. But second of all, if you're going to uh, make limited dilutions, I would recommend doing that as soon as possible because the um, uh, non-edited cells might have a uh, growth or may outgrowth your edited cells. <coughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> so coming back to generation of the Cas9 ribonucleoprotein complex. As I stated before, uh, once you order and you get your CRISPR RNA and your tracer RNA in, 
you combine them together in a one-to-one -one ratio to form the guide RNA complex, and this uh, 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 two parts are hybridized through a heat and cool cycle. And the next step you do is the addition of, of Cas9 proteins that will form together with the guide RNA complex uh, to uh, uh, become the ribonuclear uh, nuclear protein complex, or the RNP. Now, when it comes to the ratio of guide RNA complexes to, to uh, Cas9 protein, uh, we use somewhat different uh, uh, ratios. And I'm very sorry, I just now see that this should be Cas9 to guide RNA complex. So when we do lipofections, we use a one-to-one -one ratio of Cas9 over guide RNA complex. Uh, the, lip, or the RMP uh, is encapsulated by liposomes and are somewhat protected from the cellular environment initially. Uh, for electroporation, we actually use a little bit more of the guide RNA complexes where we use a 1 to 1.2 ratio. And this is because the RMP complexes are more prone to uh, uh, degradation via uh, nucleases if they're uh, uh, present, such as endo and exonucleases, and uh, uh, proteinases. So. Now to further drive home the point of the ease of use of the ribonuclear protein, I've got some more data. Um, over here, whenever you order the Cas9 protein, it comes as a 60 micromolar stock. And we re recommend storage at minus 20 degrees Celsius. We tested if we could uh, make dilutions, and we went down to one micromolar in either optimum Cas9 buffer or PBS. And we found that if we store the Cas9 protein or the diluted Cas9 protein at four degrees, uh, we did not see any decrease in activity for up to one month. When it comes to the storage of the ribonucleo protein complex, we also made uh, uh, dilutions of uh, the RMPs uh, down to one micromolar in either optimum Cas9 buffer and PBS. And on this slide, I will go over the uh, results. So the control is our, our two sites on the H, or we tested two sites on the HBRT gene, uh, which I refer to as six and, and, and eight. And the control is made up of freshly uh, uh, generated RMP complexes. And as you can see, that for site six, we achieved roughly 70% editing. And uh, for site eight, which is more sensitive, we uh, obtained about 50% editing. Now, over this part, uh, these are where we uh, stored the diluted RMP complexes uh, at one micromolar at either minus 80, minus 20, or 4 degrees Celsius. And for the more robust side, side 6, we, did, we do not see a lot of change uh, depending on the uh, storage temperature. Now, for the more sensitive side, this HPRT side 8, we can see a slight decrease in its activity at minus 20 degrees. So one thing to point out that this stability uh, test is ongoing, and this time point is now two weeks at these different temperatures. So right now, we would recommend uh, either up to four degrees, or, or sorry, up to two weeks, you can store your RMP complexes uh, at, at four degrees in these different buffers. Uh, but probably for the long-term storage, minus 80 degrees is the way to go. Um, we also compared Cas9 protein from uh, different vendors uh, over, say, four different sites at the HBRT uh, uh, gene. And one thing that we noticed was that certain uh, uh, Cas9 aliquots from suppliers gave relatively low um, efficiency, whereas other sites drop down its activity somewhat, and then especially again with this more sensitive HBRT site, we see a decrease in the uh, editing efficiency. Now, our protein, uh, together with the one from supplier A, performed uh, well over all the three uh, different loci. One, one point that I want to, or one thing that I want to point out is uh, off-target effects, and especially the, uh, um, the effect that uh, 
that the methodology has on uh, off-target effects generation. So one thing that I want to point out, if you use RMP complexes and you introduce them into the cell, if you follow the presence of the protein, you can see that immediately after four hours, there's still a lot of protein present, but the protein is degraded uh, with losing its activity definitely, or most of its activity after 48 to 72 hours. Now conversely, if you take plasmid as a source for your Cas9 um, expression, you can see the exact opposite where it takes up to 24 hours for enough Cas9 protein to be uh, formed. But one thing to point out is that Cas9 protein is still uh, produced in the cell and it will keep going on. Now one thing that I want to point out here is that if you have too much Cas9 protein, it can lead to an increase of off-target effects. And the reason why is that your guide RNA complex is not foolproof. I mean, it will surely uh, target your uh, on-target site where you have perfect uh, uh, complementary sequence of your CRISPR RNA protospacer to your genomic DNA uh, location. But if there are certain mismatches there, it will start wreaking havoc on, on other what are referred to as off-target sites where uh, the, there are some mismatches, but still the Cas9 can, can uh, uh, make double strand breaks at these sites. So the same thing holds up roughly for uh, using M mRNA, where you have prolonged Cas9 expression. So over here, you can see the amount of off-target effect when you use DNA, uh, RNA, or protein, and then uh, you can see that the amount of off-target effects generated using protein is generally the lowest. So we did a time course study where we looked at uh, uh, how fast this editing is taking place in our, in our, in our cells. So we uh, compared uh, a cell line that constitutively expresses Cas9. So the Cas9, these are referred to as the Cas9 cells. And these are the blue and the gray lines for uh, respectively HBRT site 6 and 8. And you can see that after 24 hours, the majority of editing has been done, but a plateau is mainly reached at 48 hours. We can see a very similar effect when we use RMP complexes, where uh, for each site, a similar uh, uh, increase in activity can be observed. So we usually recommend in testing your uh, editing efficiency at 48 hours. Now this also underlines, if I go back one slide, is that after 48 hours, the majority of editing has been done. And if you're using the RMP system, your Cas9 protein has been turned over, indicating that your off-target effect can be reduced using the uh, RMP system. Now, uh, again, I, in, in the previous slide, I showed that the, use, that the use of RMP leads to uh, similar amounts of editing efficiency compared to Cas9 expressing cells, where you have a continuous uh, uh, presence of Cas9. So we tested more sites on the HBRT gene, and indeed we see that if we use the RMP complex, that uh, roughly the same editing efficiencies can be, can be found over, um, across the HBRT gene, indicating that the RMP strategy leads to maximum uh, editing efficiency. Again, I kind of want to point out here is that this is based on that T7 and the nuclease uh, assay where uh, we, we, where it underestimates the amount of editing present. So if you subject all these samples to sequencing, you will probably see a lot higher editing percentages. So you can express Cas9 in cells in, in different ways. Uh, like I've shown in the previous slides, the RMP way 
uh, leads to maximum editing efficiency. And for instance, in the green bars here, you can see the results when we test it in, human, in, in a human cell line. And uh, if we compare it to Cas9 expression coming from an mRNA or that the amount of editing that we see or the editing efficiency is significantly lower. Also, if we look at mouse or rat cell lines, we can see the same pattern occurring where the amount of editing uh, achieved using mRNA and plasmid is just generally lower than RNP. Um, of course, the HBRT gene or certain exons in it are, are not the only ones that we are testing. We have tested uh, dozens of different genes and exons within those genes. And one thing that we did notice sometimes that, that certain sites are specifically uh, 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 not as active using R RMP. So for instance, here you can see that when we take a look at editing efficiency on the CCR5 gene, you can see that a lot of sites actually produce similar results as I shown before, but other sites we see that the uh, editing efficiency took a hit. And one thing that we uh, uh, thought about was that this might be because the CRISPR RNA and the tracer RNA uh, can be prone to uh, uh, nuclease activity and thereby leading to uh, a less prolonged presence of the guide RNA complex. So one thing that we have done is we, we study different ways to modify the CRISPR and tracer RNAs. And we came up with an optimal uh, modification pattern for, for each of the two. Um, and this was done after testing hundreds of different modification patterns. So as of now, now, if you order your CRISPR RNA, your tracer RNA, RNA, both of them come as a modified version. Still, I have to point out that they, uh, it does not influence its target specificity. Uh, specificity. Uh, it, it functions exactly the same as the unmod, but the biggest difference is that uh, the stability is increased, and this should lead to a higher um, uh, cleavage percentages, and this is something that we see here, for instance, in, in this side. Once we started using the modified uh, altar RNA, uh, we, we saw that the editing efficiency came, came back to normal levels, and that was for the other ones, too. Still, there was, there was one site that uh, did not perform as well, but we definitely saw an, saw an increase. But if you follow the recommendations of, or, of using, say, three CRISPR RNAs per target gene, you should be able to at least have uh, a couple that, that work well. Now, um, for specific details of doing the experiments, I would like to refer to the uh, uh, user manual, which, which, you can be which can be found on our uh, website. And that's where we go into more detail about how much to use in which experiment, how much lipid, how much our, uh, protein, et cetera. Uh, but I would, I would refer to the user manual for that. Now the second part of the presentation, I would like to go into the delivery of the Cas9 ribonuclear protein complex um, and also talk a little bit about the optimization strategies that you, that you can do. So uh, for our uh, regular used uh, uh, cell lines, we, we, we use lipofection to deliver our RMPs. And uh, what you do is once you've formed your RMP complexes, you mix them together with your lipids, uh, incubate them for a little bit of time so that the RMP can be encapsulated and form liposomes. And once this process has occurred, you can apply it to your cells, and, the, uh, and that's a means of transfection. Now, one thing that I do want to point out is that your Cas9 protein is slightly positively charged. Uh, and this can have negative effects on, on, on the liposome formation. However, if you uh, have your guide RNA complex bound to your uh, Cas9 protein, the overall charge is negative. So these complexes can be made. However, I, uh, we recommend to incubate your uh, uh, 
encapsulated RMP uh, to your cells quickly, so within 10 to 20 minutes. If you have cell lines that are harder to, uh, uh, or cell lines or primary cells that are harder to transfect, we recommend the use of electroporation. Um, and what you do is you mix your RMP together with your cells in the electroporation solution and then electroporate. One thing that we have found though is if you need to trypsinize your, your cells, it is very important to wash your cells with say PBS after your trypsinization because trypsin uh, contains a lot of nuclease activity and this will degrade your guide RNA complex and your uh, editing efficiency uh, will, will, will plummet. So when it comes to transfection optimization, uh, I think uh, if you want to pursue a certain level of editing, you can drive that editing efficiency by the amount of RMP uh, that you apply to your cells. But if you do lipofection, uh, the amount of RMP is also dependent on the amount of lipids that you put in because you want to have a good lipid to RMP ratio. The other thing that drives editing efficiency is your cell type and the cell viability. So what happens, for instance, if you try to push the system too hard and you want to add too much RMP complex to, to, to drive higher editing percentages, because you add too much lipid to it, the uh, cell viability will actually go go down. So it's, a, so it's a fine balance between how much RMP you introduce to your cell and uh, how viable your cells are and whether toxicity takes place. This, uh, this, this message is actually driven home on, on, on this slide where we tested a number of different lipid reagents at different amounts while keeping the amount of RMP uh, the same. Now, overall, you can see that uh, the lipid that worked best in our hands is lipofectamine RNAi max. Um, we ob obtained similar results using CRISPR max, which is a newer, newer product. But what you can uh, observe that if you increase the amount of lipids, you will get higher uh, editing efficiency. However, you can reach a certain point and add too much lipids where toxicity becomes prevalent. Uh, and this uh, amount of toxicity can differ between the different lipids, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's something that you need to pay clo clo close attention to. So when it comes to optimizing your lipofection strategies, uh, we would uh, recommend following the protocol that is in, this, in our user manual. Uh, include positive and negative controls, um, especially if you're testing new CRISPR RNAs uh, and, you, and you don't know uh, uh, what the effect will be. Uh, it, is, it is always good to have some positive controls to see that your methodology is working. Furthermore, I would say pay close attention to your cell viability uh, because the lipids that you use or the concentration can have uh, a negative effect on your cell viability. Furthermore, use low passage numbers and subconfluent cell cell cultures to uh, optimally, or just to keep your cells happy, basically. When it comes to optimization, uh, and if that's necessary, you can test a range of RMP concentrations. Uh, you can also test different ratios of your RMP to your cationic lipids, um, and you can test different amounts of cells per lipofection. If uh, you still are not getting very good editing efficiencies using lipofection, we would recommend the use of electroporation. So uh, there are two systems that are fairly popular and that we have in our, in our lab too. Uh, one system to do electroporation is the Amex and Nucleofection system by Lanza, and the other one is the Neon Transfection system by Thermo Fisher. What I like about the Lanza system is that it comes in different formats, up to a 96 wall format, and this makes it very easy to do high throughput studies. Um, Lanza also provides you with uh, the right electroporation protocols based on uh, uh, online protocols for many cell lines and primary cells. Uh, the drawback, though, is that it's somewhat of a black box in that the 
electroporation parameters are not known. It's just based on the code. Now, this is different in the neon transfection system, and that's something that I like about their, their system, where you uh, can put in known parameters. So based on voltage, the length of your electroporation in milliseconds, and then the number of pulses that you can do. Uh, it also, uh, the system comes with an easy optimization protocol where you can uh, figure out quickly what the best electroporation parameters are for your cell line or primary cell culture. Uh, also, NEON, or uh, so, sorry, Thermo Fisher provides you with an online database where they have optimal parameter settings for different cell lines. Uh, both, both systems are fairly expensive, uh, though. Um, one thing that I want to point out is that um, when it comes to the NEON system, everything is based on a single QVET. So making it uh, or using the system in a high throughput fashion is somewhat of, uh, of a challenge. So what to look for when you're doing electroporation? Uh, it, it requires a uh, higher concentrations of your RMP, and we're talking in the range of two to four micromolar. Whereas for lipofection, we regularly do uh, RMP transfections using a 10 nanomolar concentration. If you take a look into the uh, uh, volume, we, we typically use about 50 times as much uh, RMP uh, in a electroporation experiment compared to a lipofection experiment. I think I mentioned this before, but uh, use, if you electroporate your RMP complex, um, use, uh, it, it, the, the, the complex is not encapsulated, so it's not really protected by uh, lipids in the case of lipofection. So it makes it more accessible to nucleases and proteinases. Um, so uh, there's a couple of things that you can do. For instance, test your uh, 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 buffers for uh, presence of RNases using, say, RNAs alert. Uh, the other thing is that electroporation parameters differ per cell line. So if you use different cell lines, we would always recommend to find the optimized protocol if it's available or otherwise uh, in, in the databases for, for either system, or otherwise follow an optimization protocol, uh, which is provided by both uh, systems. So the optimization strategy for electroporation is first find your optimal electroporation parameters, and then we would recommend following the, the, the points in our IDT user manual. Uh, also, again, include positive and negative controls to make sure that your uh, methodology is working. Uh, one, one other thing that, that we found was that adding uh, carrier DNA really boosts editing efficiency, and this is particular for doing electroporation. So, uh, and I'll have a slide on that later on, but uh, addition of single-stranded oligonucleotides really drives the efficiency. Again, use low passage numbers and uh, cells that are not confluent. Pay close attention to your cells to find the optimal conditions, and if necessary, you can test the range of RMP concentrations and different amounts of cells per electroporation. So over here, we uh, looked at the editing efficiency uh, at different ribonuclear protein complex concentrations, where we start with a low going up to a high dose for the either the robust HBRT uh, site and the one that is more sensitive. And you can see that for uh, specific sites, you can use uh, likely less RMP uh, uh, because it reaches a plateau sooner than with other sites. But this is something that you can test to find the uh, optimal ribonuclear protein complex concentration. We typically uh, uh, recommend to use a concentration between two and four micromolars. Coming back to the carrier DNA, so we use single-stranded oligonucleotides that do not have any homology with uh, any locus uh, on your, on your uh, genomic uh, uh, sequences. And what we've seen when we tested uh, uh, these single-stranded oligos at different lengths and at different concentrations, that uh, at, at least 100 uh, nucleotide-long oligonucleotides have a very positive effect 
on, on driving editing efficiency. So we uh, recommend using the uh, uh, carrier DNA in your electroporation. Now here's an example of an optimization protocol using the NEON system. Uh, there are 24 different uh, electroporation parameters that are, that are uh, 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 checked. And what you can see that every, in this case for HEC-293 cells, when transfecting uh, RMP, you can see that different amounts of editing efficiency can be observed. But one thing to keep in mind is to uh, link this editing efficiency to your cell viability. So the darker the, uh, green, the more viable your cells are. And then based on this, on these results, we would, for instance, recommend a protocol or the settings that are present in uh, 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 protocol number number 12. Now, the advantages of the Alter CRISPR Cas9 system are as follows for your guide RNA complex. Uh, the two part or the two oligos that we that we provide in our uh, all our system are. Uh, have quality control manufacturing, knowing that every time when you order it, this is this is what you get. There's an ease of use because you just mix the two and then later on your protein and you're ready to go. We now have modifications to each of the two uh, RNAs for prolonged stability in cellular environments, and we have definitely redu reduced toxicity from the innate immune uh, system. The advantages of using Cas9 nuclease is, first of all, the ease of use. We have controlled delivery, fewer off-target effects. We have not observed any uh, toxicity, and on the long run, it's more cost-effective. So right now, we sell uh, Cas9 protein, the CRISPR and tracer RNAs, and the control kits. Uh, it's a complete system, details you can find online. And for delivery, we use either cationic lipids, and right now, we recommend the use of RNA IMX and CRISPR max, and uh, the other uh, uh, way to, to introduce your RMP is by electroporation, and we use the nuclear infection system by Lanza or the NEON system by Thermo. Uh, additional resources you can find online uh, at our website, where there's a user guide, short protocols, different webinars, tutorial videos, and then a performance tab where you can find some key data that, um, on, our, on our products. If you have questions, feel free to contact IDTNA, or IDT DNA. We're always there for you, uh, available for web chat, email, or phone, or, of course, by email. And I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation today. Okay. Uh, with that, I will thank Ralph for presenting. That was a very nice presentation on CRISPR. <clears throat> and... Uh, we do have some questions already, but if you haven't already asked your question, you can type that into the questions box, and you'll find that in the control panel, the GoToWebinar control panel. And there's a little plus sign or an up arrow, depending on whether you're on a PC or a Mac. And if you click on that, it'll make the window larger. You can type your question in, and we will get through as many of them as we can. So I'm just going to start at the top of the list here. Um, so this first question, Ralph, is... Um, it's about the, the lipofection, and if you introduce the, the crRNA and tracer RNA with the Cas9, is there any evidence that the risk complex, so the RNAi mechanism, would be activated? Um, uh, in, 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 and because the customer is afraid that it will be driven to different locations, I, I, I think the whole uh, uh, mechanism of, of, of RNAi is, is uh, different uh, than, than the CRISPR-Cas9 system, so I don't think they have to worry about that. Okay. Uh, um, with regards to making the RNP complex, do you see any decreased cutting activity if you use higher amounts of Cas9 to GRNA? Um, if it comes to skewing the ratio of Cas9 to your guide RNA complex, you mean? Yeah. Um, no, no. We since since the active part 
is a guide RNA or two part like a CRISPR, one CRISPR molecule, one tracer molecule, and one Cas9 molecule. That combination is the is the active uh, 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 component. So you can put in more of one or the other, but what 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 drives it is is the uh, formation of those uh, one to one to one complexes. Um, if you put in more Cas9 and it's not bound to any guide RNA complex, it will not do its do its do its job. So that's why we recommend the one to one when it comes to liposuction. Like I said, when it comes to electroporation, we like to increase the amount of guide RNA complex somewhat because we see a benefit uh, in the amount of editing. But I mean, it's very much an empirical way because it might uh, differ from cell line to cell line. So um, yeah, that is why we recommend testing those uh, settings if you uh, do not get the amount of editing that you uh, hope to see. Sure. Um, the next question is, um, do you think that there is uh, any difference in performance? Like if you have, if you're able to, encapsulate the Cas9 separately and the guide RNA, the CRISPR guide RNA complex separately, that that would mm -hmm. perform differently than using the RNP completely assembled and yeah. encapsulated? So, uh, theoretically, uh, no. If they are, they, they will form together within the cell. For instance, if we, if you take a if you use Cas9 expressing cells or a stably expressing Cas9 cell line, uh, the, the only thing that you uh, uh, transpect is your guide RNA complex, and we still find that editing is occurring. The only thing that I want to point out is that uh, the Cas9 protein is slightly positively charged, and I think that uh, the liposome formation in the absence of a guide RNA complex will uh, induce problems for encapsulating your Cas9 protein. So it's mainly the charge. The nucleic that, acid uh, adds a negative yeah. charge that's beneficial to the encapsulation. Exactly. Yes, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, talking about the RNP and cellular localization, have uh, has anybody done any immuno cytostaining to see if the Cas9 ribonuclear protein, if it goes if some of it ends up in the nucleus and some of it ends up in the cytoplasm and if it's degraded differently in those two places? Um, we have we have started looking into that in closer detail using fluorescently uh, labeled CRISPR and tracer RNAs. Uh, we, we do see it end up in the cell. Uh, the majority that we can observe is likely in endosomes and I think it's just more of a representation of abundance of our fluorescent uh, uh, signal, but I mean we surely observe proper editing efficiencies when we use those fluorescently labeled CRISPR and tracer RNAs. Um, so yes, it, it, it does end up, but I think the turnover might be fairly uh, quick. The other thing that you have to point out, or that I want to point out, is that if you have, say, a human derived cell. You only have two alleles and each allele can only uh, have one Cas9 protein on there together with one guide RNA complex. The strength of a single fluorescent uh, molecule is not strong enough to, to see that uh, specifically at the location. Um, so yeah, um, right now we're also looking into the use of fluorescently labeled guide RNA complexes and how we can use it in fact sorting, for instance. But that's something that we're working on. OK. Um, next question is, have we compared off-target um, effects for the, the IDT alter CRISPR-Cas9 nuclease compared to Cas9 nucleases from other vendors? Um, no. We have not done that directly. No, no, but it's but that's in the pipeline. Yep. Okay. Um, how would we do off-target analysis? It's right now. It's it's still a pretty labor-intensive process to do off-target, right? Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it is. It is. I mean, uh, for some sites, for some target sites, based on the literature, uh, certain sites are known, so you can directly go after the known off-target sites. But if you have a CRISPR RNA where those off-target sites are not known, uh, you have to uh, do uh, next-generation sequencing uh, just to where you ligate specific primers on your cut site and then amplify the locations where cutting has, has, has taken place. But like you said, it's very labor-intensive and not, not cheap. Yeah. Right. Um, next question is, um, is this Cas9 ribonucleoprotein system that IDT has developed, is it available for engineering microbial genomes? Um, we haven't tested it ourselves. Uh, we are happy to uh, <laughs> hear feedback. So yes, yes. I, I mean, I, I cannot see why it, why it wouldn't work. The only thing where I could uh, see some uh, optimization necessity is in the delivery. Right. Delivery is often the issue. Um, the the, yeah. the CRISPR-Cas9 system from s -Pyogenes has been shown to work in lots and lots of different cell types, so it's uh, pretty robust and relatively yeah. simple as far as the number of things you have to do on paper. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's see here. Uh, is there any difference in how Cas9 is degraded, the time course, with transfection, lipofection versus electroporation? That's a good question. Uh, we have not tested that directly, but I think that that's a great, a great point. Um, and get the data on the uh, website, yeah. I think it, it also might depend on the cell type that you're using. Um, yeah, no, those are, those are, that is, that is a great, that's a great point. Okay, we do have some uh, questions related to toxicity, and I know we've done some uh, we've done some extensive research on that. And I would refer people. Some of the the performance stuff is addressed in a previous webinar given by another research scientist, Ashley Jacoby, and that was done back in October. That's on our website, um, and we can send a link to that in the follow up email. But uh, I'll, I'll just address this to Ralph right now. So, do we have some information on the toxicity of the transfection with the plasmid? with a plasmid Cas9 versus the Cas9 protein versus Cas9 mRNA? I think that the majority of toxicity we observed was using the, M, was using the mRNA. Um, uh, we, we did not see any activation of uh, uh, innate uh, uh, immune system pathways when we were using our two-part system or with the Cas9 protein uh, included with that. Um, um, and then what? And then what, what was the other part? Sorry, Hans. that that was the main the main portion was you know, okay. comparing plasmid protein and mRNA. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, yeah. um, when you say the uh, the two part system, you're referring to when we have the crRNA and tracer RNA as separate molecules that are in complex together versus yeah. the single guide RNA approach. Yeah, yeah. One one thing that I that I would like to point out is. Um, the use of plasmids uh, can can generate some some problems in itself too, because you're introducing double-stranded DNA into cells, and you're making um, double-stranded breaks and and repair uh, pathways are being activated. The chance that plasmid DNA is being incorporated uh, on your in your on-target, but also on your off-target side is uh, is present, and that's something that we do not have to worry about when using the uh, CRISPR tracer and Cas9 protein. Right. Um, and actually, here's a great follow-up to that statement you just made. So with homologous recombination, if you're using homology-directed repair in conjunction with CRISPR genome editing, um, since the success rate is not very high for homologous recombination, how does somebody know if the editing that they observe is the result of some innate mechanism incorporating that into the site versus the result of CRISPR cleaving, the CRISPR-Cas9 mechanism cleaving the DNA and then that DNA being incorporated. Yeah, no, no, that is, that is, that is indeed a great point. Um, 
one way to figure out if you get incorporation of your ACR template is, for instance, introducing uh, uh, restriction sites. So after you amplified your edited alleles, uh, then you can use those restriction sites to see if there was any incorporation of your ACR template. Another way which gives you the most definitive answer is by sequencing. So after you uh, after you're editing, you have to sequence the uh, the batch and then and then trying to figure out uh, what the percentages are. Uh, if you want to do a monoclonal selection, then you can pick or sequence uh, monoclonal populations. Uh, but but yeah, sequencing definitely gives the most definitive results or answer to your question to figure out what is what is what is incorporated. Yeah. Okay. Um, another toxicity-related question here. So, is there uh, a point at which an increasing concentration of the uh, RNP complex would also increase the amount of toxicity that you observe? Um, you know, right now, I can answer it in two in in two parts. When we use electroporation, we use high amounts of RNP. And I have not not seen any viability issues when it when it comes to increasing the amount of RMP, uh, and this goes up to 10 micromoles. When toxicity does occur, it's mainly with lipofection. And if you the 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 ratio of lipid to RMP complex is important for the proper formation of your uh, encapsulated uh, RMP molecules. So if you increase the amount of RMP complexes, you have to increase the amount of lipids, otherwise your uh, editing efficiency will uh, drop. So it's, 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 it's mainly the lipids and the amount of lipids that will cause toxicity to the cell. Sure. Um, so I want to make a quick point here. Um, I noticed that it is uh, 2 o'clock and um, this webinar is scheduled to end at 2 o'clock. Uh, we can continue to take a few more questions. I just want people to be aware that if we haven't answered your question and you need to go or whatever, we will be uh, um, responding to people by email, and uh, we will get you an answer to your question. If you need one quicker, please, by all means, you know, call or uh, email our support um, people. And uh, we did record the webinar, so the webinar will be posted on our website. The slides are available at uh, slideshare.net. Uh, forward slash IDTDNA. So um, you can check out those resources, and from there we'll just continue on and take a few more questions. Um, the next question that I have here is How large is the RNP complex, and how do you optimize the size of your RNP complex? Uh, well, since, since the components are always the same, uh, your your size of your RMP complex will will not differ. Uh, there's just a single Cas9 protein that comes together with a uh, with the guide RNA complex. The protein itself is 164 kilodeltons, so that uh, is is the main bulk of of the size of the protein. Okay. Uh, and here's another question: Why does adding the non-homologous carrier DNA boosts the RNP activity. Do we have any information on that? And if they yeah. add, well, hold on a second. There's a little bit more here too, Ralph, which is if we add homologous single-stranded donor for homology-directed repair, will that have any effect on the cutting efficiency? Yeah, so uh, the, the precise mechanism how carrier DNA works is still somewhat uh, unknown. Uh, we think that it drives mainly a more negative charge to your RMP complex, which makes it more efficient to get uh, 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 shuttled into your cell. Um, when it comes to the use of HDR templates in combination with carrier DNA, we would not recommend that. Uh, we've seen some some. Uh, uh, negative effects on cell viability if we introduce both HDR template and carrier DNA. Uh, so if you want to use HDR, um, I would not recommend using uh, carrier DNA in that in that setting. Would that uh, would that uh, 
HDR template would that also improve the RNP performance compared to having no carrier DNA and no template? Um, you know that that's that is uh, that is a good a, a good question, which is a little bit harder to answer because both uh, the HDR template will or can contribute to your editing efficiency. However, the editing efficiencies that we see when it comes to incorporation of your HDR template uh, is generally lower than the general editing events that you can see occurring uh, in, your, in, your, in your cell. Okay. Um, do we have any advice for somebody about how long to make the homology arms for homology-mediated repair? Mm -hmm. that, that's also something that we're actively looking into. Um, with, with conventional methodologies, uh, several KBs were uh, necessary. Uh, I think there's a couple of publications out there, too, where we, we can see that uh, significantly shorter amounts are necessary, and we get good results with, uh, with, with homologous arms as, as, as short as 70 nucleotides. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so it's, there's di a difference between single-stranded template versus double-stranded template as far as how long those arms R2, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, the other thing that you have to keep in mind, though, if you if you use double stranded ACR template, um, which is we we do uh, recognize that it's easier to make because you can use it uh, uh, based on PCR amplification. Um, it it does uh, allow for the potential integration of that double stranded DNA into off off target sites. So that's something to keep in mind. That's where we recommend uh, uh, using single strand uh, DNA for your HDR template. Okay. Um, so the next question here um, Have we tried using just oligos as carrier DNA links between 20 and 95 nucleotides? Uh, no, no, so far not. No, no. I, I tested 20, 95, and 200 nucleotides. And then is our uh, SPCAS9 nucleus, is that just the wild type SPCAS9, or is it some sort of variant? No, we, we have introduced as the, as the full name of our proteins as a couple of uh, nuclear localization signals to uh, improve the uh, efficiency of uh, uh, targeting the nucleus. And it's not any other type, like it's not a Nick Ace or a uh, like the high fidelity thing that no. uh, has been no. in the literature a little bit. Okay. No. Um, what is the advantage of using the CR RNA and tracer RNA as a separate molecule, as, se as separate molecules? Um, that is also a good, a good, a good question. Um, it's it's mainly uh, quality control. If you can provide shorter RNAs, the amount of quality control that you can do on those uh, shorter R RNA oligos is is higher. The efficiency and the yields are are, are higher, and that drives the price. Second, uh, the tracer RNA for every uh, CRISPR tracer complex or guide RNA complex, the tracer component is always the same. The thing that varies is the CRISPR R RNA. So you can order. Uh, different types of uh, CRISPR RNAs and always use the same tracer RNA. Also, the tracer RNA is significantly longer, which uh, drives up the price. So by being able to make it in large batches, we can uh, provide our customers with a competitive pricing on our tracer tracer RNA. Okay. Um, you mentioned the g -blocks gene fragments a couple times uh, during the presentation, mm -hmm. and somebody was just wondering if you could explain a little bit more about what the g -blocks fragments are. Oh, yeah, those are uh, synthetic uh, double-stranded uh, uh, DNA fragments up to 2,000 base pairs uh, that, that uh, customers can use and design themselves on our uh, websites, and what 
people tend to use in the CRISPR field is uh, drive single guide RNAs off of these D, uh, G blocks by introduction introduction of a U6 promoter. Yeah, they, they have like a million applications. They're basically, the, the structure's essentially like a PCR product, but it's completely synthetic, so you can order whatever sequence you need. You know, within the limits of, you know, whatever manufacturing, I like can't make things with tons of, uh, you know, GC-rich sequence or repetitive motifs and stuff, but there's, there's a lot that you can do with them. Very useful tool. Yep. Um... Here's a question for you. This is a storage question. You kind of addressed this earlier, but I'll ask it again. So how long can you store the mixed uh, RNP complex? They want to inject zebrafish embryos early in the morning, and it, they say it would be um, nice if they could mix the – if they could make the complex the previous day. Mm -hmm. And yeah, what so, storage so conditions? Yeah, so so far we have uh, uh, stored our – RMP complexes um, at a couple of different temperatures. And we're, we're kind of in the middle of this uh, long-term stability assay. But for up to two weeks, we have not seen any decreased activity when stored at 4 degrees or at minus 80 degrees. So, um, yeah. So certainly I'm, overnight I'm, probably won't be a problem for them. No. No, I am, I am, I am confident about that. Yep. Do we have any... Uh, Buffer recommendation for doing that? Like, is any of the are any of the recommended buffers preferable over the other for longer term? Yeah. So so far, we have tested uh, Optiman, PBS, and our Cas9 buffer. Uh, we didn't we did not see any clear difference between any of those buffers. Um, if if you have your own homemade buffer, uh, we would recommend uh, testing it yourself. Unfortunately. Uh, we do not have the capability to test every every buffer, but with the buffers that we tested so far, um, we have achieved good results uh, when it comes to stability. Okay. Some repeats here. Uh, so I'm just going to ask this question, Ralph. I, I, I know the answer to this, and it'd just be nice to just return the answer to, to people who are listening. Um, has anybody used this our crispr cas 9 product with plant cells that you're aware of? Uh, I am not aware of anybody using it yet. I think one of the major drawbacks in the plant field is getting proper delivery uh, I think a lot of people use gene guns or biolistic uh, methodologies uh, to to get plasmids in. Uh, I mean, generally the cell walls of, of plant cells are a lot uh, harder to cross. Uh, so if our RMP methodology it can be uh, used in plant cells, remains to be seen. Okay. Uh, T7E1 as a question, which is, what is the least number of base changes that can be reliably detected with the T7E1 nuclease? Um, oh, that that is that is a tricky question. That I I think we have to uh, come back to this customer. I knew I know that T7 uh, has problems detecting single uh, insertions and deletions. Um, to be honest, when it comes to two base pairs, uh, I, I don't have the data on top of my head. I know that it's able to pick those up, but I don't know, you know, like how reliable that is. I'm not sure yes. if it's like, you know, like once we get to greater than one, is everything equal or is it, does it still struggle yeah. with those low insertions? So yeah, we yeah. should follow up with this person. So, so one thing that we do have on our website is a uh, distribution using different types of guide RNA complexes to see what type of indels are being formed and these are in the form of pie charts. And that's something that you can find on, their, on our website. Uh, I, I don't know on top of my head what the, uh, what the exact numbers are there, but that, that, that data is, is out there. And again, it's based on sequence data. So that, that should be pretty definitive. 
there is at least one citation, possibly two, about you know the what T seventy one detects, and you know it's pretty extensively studied too. That would probably be worth looking at. And I know that at least one of those is cited in the uh, user guide, so it would be a good place to refer people to. Um, and then I'm just going to follow that up with a question that just came in, which is uh, why is the surveyor kit not recommended for the mismatch detection? Um, I think I think it's definitely possible to use the surveyor kit, but I think we we found the most reliable results using the T7 and the Nucleus One kit. So again, I'll contribute just a little bit of my knowledge here too, which is I, I've worked a bit on the uh, our surveyor product line as well, and um, surveyor is just very sensitive to buffer conditions too. So you know, at the T71, we find it's more flexible depending on how you do your amplification step with whatever PCR buffer um, you use. Whereas with the surveyor, oftentimes you have to either add magnesium or do a purification step in between, and it gets very finicky about the buffer conditions. Um, they, they, they both have their advantages. And again, it's been studied. I know that the citation, that one of the citations at least that's out there is comparing surveyor and T71 for these assays specifically. I know that citation's in the user guide if you want to refer to that. Um, all right, so it's 2.15, and um, we've had quite a few people leave now, So, and there's still a lot of questions. Um, I think at this point we'll wrap things up, and we will uh, respond to the rest of these questions by email. Um, we, you'll all be hearing from us. We will uh, be giving you a follow-up email, and if you do want to contact us, if you haven't asked your question, you'd still like to ask a question, by all means, comp contact application support at idtdna.com and uh, you can get a response that way. Um, we've recorded the webinar, and uh, it'll be available on our website on the support tab in our video library. And we also have it, we'll have it on our YouTube site, which is www.youtube.com forward slash idtdnabio. There's lots of webinars on there, including some past CRISPR webinars that cover some of the other performance issues and toxicity and stuff. So I encourage you all to check that out and check out the website. Uh, for CRISPR, which is idtdna.com forward slash CRISPR. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, great questions, great participation from everyone. Really, really a, a nice webinar. Uh, thanks again, Ralph, for your presentation. Yeah, you're welcome.